everyone, I'm Sloane from SloanBella.com and I am back with another energetic channeled infamous video about something that happened on July 26th, 2009. And this is a horrific um, thing to even focus on and it wasn't something that I wanted to focus on. I had no interest at all whatsoever, in fact. Um, the tone of what happened in this person's life and what was done to the other people, eight of them in total, including herself, is beyond, I can't even, I can't focus. There were five children in the minivan that this woman was driving, July 26, 2009. And I'm talking about Diane Schuler and her trip home from a getaway for three or so days driving back into the city, her husband ahead of her in the car, her own two children and her three nieces with her when she decided to get on the Tacomic Parkway going in the wrong direction. Now, I have seen a lot of accidents in my life with people that do that. I've actually seen them coming down the road at me. Los Angeles, it happens quite a bit. This and usually not with these outcomes, but this outcome to this woman's story is horrific. Not only were her two children killed, her three nieces were killed, and the car that she hit with two generations in the same family, a father and son, and their friend. So she wiped out, plus herself, just basically she caused chaos, and that's the word I'm gonna use, through her actions. Now, I know there's been a lot of documentaries done and things done on why she did what she did, but here's what I got, and it came through, and I don't know why it came through all of a sudden. I don't know if this is somebody's birthday right now or you know whatever this is. This is a day after Valentine's Day, and I started getting it before Valentine's Day. I was avoidant to do it just because I can't even think about it, so to speak, but here's, we're gonna go for it. So here's what I picked up. Okay, her birthday, I looked up her chart. I didn't look up everybody else's chart, just hers. And again, I'm going on the information online. But she is a November 13th, 1972. And according to the information online, she is a double Scorpio. Now she has a first house son. So her son is in the first house. It's not hidden in the 12th. And that's more about the Scorpio person coming out front and center in this lifetime. She also has the sun very close to Neptune, which would be your addiction issues, but that's not even why I'm talking about that. Neptune in the first house, it is not a conjunction though, it is too far in degree wise, but Neptune in the first house in reference to this woman, she would have no idea who she was as a person, meaning the reflection she looks at when she looks in the mirror is like a chameleon. It changes, first house Neptune. How do I see myself? I see myself with a confused vision. Also in Scorpio. So she saw herself as a result of things that she didn't tell other people. And I'm not talking about the addiction. I'm gonna to get to what I'm talking to because it was very clear to me and it was time to bring it out. It's not my place to bring it out, but that's just what I was getting, so I'm saying it. Um, she reflectively, when she looks at herself, she sees the hidden part of herself, the part that we don't see looking at her. So I saw that and then the thing that really caught my eye big time was Saturn in the seventh house conjuncting the eighth house cusp retrograde in the sign of Gemini. First of all, Saturn retrograde, father figure not there emotionally the way that you needed him. Okay, there's that. Secondly, conjunct the eighth house cusp in the eighth house cusp leads to abuses on a child in astrology. So when you see eighth house Saturn, you're dealing with things that go on underneath, okay, and have a karmic repercussion to it. When it's placed in the seventh house, conjuncting the eighth house, karma with your marriage partners. So she had karma all the way coming up through her life from childhood, through the father, and then through the husband, marriage partner, which would be her husband at this point. So 
this woman, Diane Schuler, when I started picking up the energy around the circumstance, and I've just got to go into this and get it out of my head, here's what I got with her. The day that she had the accident, it was very clear to me, very clear to me, that she had been hiding pieces of herself all the way along in her lifetime. And I'm not just talking drugs and alcohol. When she's talking about or making me feel with her, I got impressions. It's not really communication. It's impressions around the circumstances. And the other thing I will say is all of the kids stood around me for a split second, separate of her, but all of them stood around me. They all held hands. And this was the cutest thing. I don't know if the family ever went to Hawaii together. And I think some of the babies were like too, too little to do that. But they stood around me in grass skirts, around a fire, having fun like they were in Hawaii. And they all stood around the circle, these kids together. And they were dressed in Hawaiian, I guess like luau type outfit. And that's exactly where they were when I tapped into the energy. Some sort of a festive party and they all looked up and there was a happiness or a joy to them. So I'm quite confident that the kids crossed over in peace which means nothing when you lose your child. Let me just say, it doesn't matter because you want your child with you. So in truth, I doubt it matters to anybody in the family what anybody says about their children because they want the children with them. Now, what I did get, there was one of the children and I'm trying to remember all their names. Um, I believe her daughter's name was Erin and I believe there was Alyssa, Emma, and Kate. It's Kate that stands out to me. Kate is the one that stands out. I think she might have been the baby niece, so the three nieces, and then her own daughter, Erin, okay? And then she had one boy that survived. So what happened is she drove, as we know, on the wrong way on the freeway, and I asked her, like I asked in my head, that's how I'm doing it, I asked, what the hell, like what was that about? And I was pushed right back my head was pushed right back and right through time before she had children all the way back to her childhood. So let's get this straight is what I heard in my head. There's a lot of rage on the other side from this woman, I'm sure because she realizes what she's done and there's no way to correct it in this life as far as the way we see it. There is a way to correct it on the other side. She is also, by the way, reunited with her mother at the time and I think I read somewhere or heard something that her mother, she would not speak to her mother in in life but this is what's really interesting I found interesting the bond between the mother and daughter was broken in early childhood probably around the age of five or six the reason it was broken the mother who had the reputation I think she took off with somebody next door she took off with another guy there's a very key reason for this and I want people to understand this is what she wants people to understand I probably want them to understand it too she wants people to understand that when you do something at one point in time, okay, you cause something that causes a reaction, that causes a problem. Are you responsible fully, okay, for causing that problem years later when the actual problem started years earlier and the problem started when she was a child and I'm going right to it. I'm saying it, she's making me feel this so I apologize to anybody who doesn't wanna hear it. But she's basically saying that in the household she was raised, there was sexual abuse on her. She was looked at like that. Now, I don't know which brother it is but there is one brother and there is one father. So. This is no one in their household. So let's go back to that. She's five and six years old and this shit starts happening to her, all right? So she's a child and she is being abused on a sexual level. Things are going on within the household that the mother knew but didn't know, the brothers knew but their children, and one brother is complicit in a way in that he may have done something inappropriate with her as well. And it all was swept under the carpet. So nobody speaks about it. Everybody keeps this appearance of, look at us. We're a good family. The mother, i.e. the scapegoat, the mother, the scapegoat, she's the scapegoat, okay? She's the one that reacted to the circumstances of her husband 
not being a husband to her, as in not being physical, not being sexual, not doing anything. I have both a mother and daughter here. So the mother is like, he didn't come near her and there was verbal abuse and there was aggression, but it was aggression in the point of negligence. So the mother, being a young mother herself and having all of these children thought, what the hell is wrong with me? What like what that's where you would go. You would go to yourself. Why doesn't my husband want me? Am I, you know, fat, ugly, stupid, too many children, not smart enough, whatever it is. You would go right there. That father knows what he did. He knows what he allowed. Those brothers know what happened. Okay. The entire family has hidden that part of the personality of Diane. The mother said that the way that she felt in the marriage, and I'm just going on what I'm picking up literally right now, the way that she felt in the marriage was that her daughter was being used against her, so she stepped out because she was so miserable. So if you have and are married to somebody who is abusive to you and thwarts you, that's the word used, thwarts, thwarting, stifling, abusing, stopping, threatening. She left with somebody who treated her nicely. If you're a trapped animal in a cage and you chew your way out of the cage, you're probably going to go to the nice people that are going to feed you something and you're going to give them your attention, even though it doesn't always work out. Okay. So this is what I feel went on. Never for one second does the mother say, and she holds her daughter actually, that she actually thought that um, Diane's father was abusing her like that. Not for one second did she think that. She thought the abuse was in a different way. She looked at it that probably went out of her range of thinking. And I have to say, for her to marry somebody like that, she had to have been around it on some level growing up. Maybe not to the same extreme, but she patterned something. The mother I'm talking about. So the father used his daughter to get even with the mother, even though he didn't want the mother, and then blamed the mother and turned his little army of family against the mother. Now, I think the boys, the male children, probably understood because the dad did not have much use for them in the way that he had for his daughter, and there was abuse going on. She has one brother that knows exactly what the hell I'm talking about. I'm not saying when you're a kid and someone's being abused in your family that you're aware of it because I don't think you are, and you're a child. It's not your job. It's not your responsibility. However, there is one brother that knows. So this woman, Diane, she grows up, she paints herself through that first house Neptune, okay, and I forgot to say her moon's in Aquarius, in the third house. So first of all, that's very detached and it can justify behaving one way in order to avoid being seen in another way, which is exactly how I see her temperament. She got so used to living in denial. Now, how does this happen? We ask, why are people in denial? Why do people avoid the truth? Why do they do this? Well, when you're a kid and you grow up in a house where you're sexually abused, if you speak out, you're going to be targeted. She watched her mother be targeted. She never forgave her mother for putting her in the target's eye line, okay? So once the mother left, she literally became the target of her father's obsession, rage, control, mental illness, whatever you want to call it. So when we're looking at where this woman's life went and what happened, we're looking at a young child who's abused, shuts it down completely, develops a personality that's overly perfectionistic, overly judgmental, all of these things that are just triggers to not allow yourself to show the abuse. Some of them go the other way and they become like, you know, full on abuse people tripping over themselves in the middle of the street. This was not acceptable to her because she could not deal with the shame, but the shame went back to the initial childhood abuse, period. Okay, the shame went back to that. The shame should have been put on to where it belonged, the abuser, not her. And if someone had stepped in at the time, but she was so, so shut down after having this happen that she went about her life. She did blame her mother. She blamed her mother tremendously. That relationship is actually healing on the other side. Although at the moment, Diane still feels, still feels like she needs to speak the truth of what happened. And I think we're going 10, 11, 12 years since this horrific thing happened. And as I'm saying, she was coming home from a camping trip and she's talking about 
the two days prior to it, she always had a drinking issue in that she liked to drink and she liked, this is what I'm getting. She liked the idea that when she drank, she could control herself. So there was an overinflated sense of ego. Like I can, and she started, I'm seeing around the age of 16. She also had like an eating disorder is what I'm seeing. So the drinking and the eating went in tandem. And this often happens with abuse victims. You know, they can have all kinds of eating disorders, all kinds of addiction issues, okay? With the eating disorder being an addiction at the same time. So you can have all kinds of circumstances where these things happen and you've got, you know, people who uh, are hiding behind their emotions and feelings because they can't bring it to the surface. She was always afraid to say it because there was one brother and I'm, uh, the, the way that I want to describe it is that brother actually got married first or left the house first, whichever one that is. I'm feeling like there's some complicitness in this circumstance. I don't feel any of those kids got along well with the dad. What he did was manipulate and blame the mother for his own shitty actions, period. The reason she turned a blind eye is because her husband wouldn't touch her. Obviously, they had all those kids. I think Diane had three brothers and herself, so that's four kids, meaning they had sex four times. But other than that, this woman was basically, her life was nothing with the husband. It wasn't a joyous thing because he wasn't about doing that. He was about control and domination, period, okay? So that's how I'm seeing that. And I think Diane couldn't let anyone know it because she had nobody else looking after her. The mother made the mistake of taking off without recognizing the full-fledged signs. She just thought it was like overly attentive to the daughter to get at her so that she would never be like close to her daughter. She didn't think of it and extend the thought past that. You have to watch in these families because there is a dynamic that goes on. And if you go back into childhood, you'll see the personality traits developing with each of the kids, depending on their position in the family. So when I'm looking at this energy with Diane, I'm looking at her and she's talking about being at the lake. Now she really did love her husband. I believe his name is Daniel. And they had a son, Brian, and a little girl named Erin. Uh, those were their kids. And then they were camping with the three nieces that I mentioned before, which I believe the one girl Girl's name is Alyssa and then there's Emma and Kate. Now something about Kate during that weekend camping trip triggered Diane. Okay so something in Kate's actions, Kate's age, Kate's face, Kate's appearance, something in the way that that little baby girl looked, said, did, or acted actually triggered Diane. Also when I look to the relationship between her and the husband, the husband played some bullshit games with her too. He doesn't get off scot-free is what she says. She was very dominant, she says of herself. She was so controlling out of fear, out of not wanting anyone to see what was really going on. I feel like she loved her husband. She married her husband because she loved him. But I also feel like he wasn't trustworthy or she couldn't count on him emotionally. He did undermine her. And I am hearing an argument in my head go on the, probably the night before they left where they're having words about something. Now, Kate has triggered this. So I think I'm understanding that Diane is responding from a trigger, not necessarily to what's going on in front of her. So let's use a different word for that. That would be like a flash flashback, like post-traumatic stress. I don't know what little Kate said, and I don't know why Diane started yelling at her husband about that or was like it could have been about something completely different and she was triggered this is what I feel so they left the campsite now I'm not seeing her she's not showing me that she's drinking like some a-hole a before she gets in the car but she is pissed at her husband and she is saying I'm not going to do this anymore I'm not going to do this they're fighting over something and she does fight with him quite a bit but it's on the down low because she doesn't want anyone to know who they are now in a second hand thing her husband is slightly passive aggressive and I didn't look his sign up Slightly passive aggressive in that he smiles to her face, but behind her back, he likes triggering her. She's really good at composing herself until certain things come up. I get the distinct impression from what I'm feeling that Kate, who was approximately five years old, was the age that she was when her abuse started. And I get the feeling that her husband 
maneuvered around this child in a way that made her triggered. I'm not saying he did anything. It's not what I'm saying, but for her, it triggered her. So if you are a child that has been sexually abused, you grow up and you become a mother, there are things that will trigger you about the partner that you're with because it's a flashback, kind of like post-traumatic stress. And I feel like she was reacting from that, honestly. They also are telling me, this is not her, this is around her. The children are not with her, by the way, I said this. Um, they're playing Ring Around the Rosie. This is what, because I can kind of feel the energy over here. They're playing Ring Around the Rosie and they're definitely being kids. They're being kids and enjoying themselves. They don't want to talk about what happened. They don't want to talk about it. I do feel like before anything happened, um, that they literally crossed out of their body. They talk to Brian all the time, the little boy that survived all the time. All the time they talk to him. They talk to him to make sure that he's okay. Now, this is an interesting thing. They feel that he's the one that needs to be watched by them because he's still here and they're there. That's kind of the feeling. So they are taking care of him while they are over there and he is here. So when Diane got into the minivan, she was definitely triggered. She's showing me a voice that's talking to her. You're a piece of shit. You're, you should be disgusted. They know who you are. You can't hide anymore. People can see you. It's obvious. What are you going to do? Like she's being taunted by something in her own thoughts. When she comes out of the stores, I know she was looking for pain pills. She did tell me, and again, I'm absorbing energy, so do I really know that it's her? No, or the energy around it. So I'll just word the energy around it. She was taking medicine, something like um, for pain medicine, real pain medicine, not over store-bought pain medicine. She was taking medicine. I mean, not that day. She took it all the way along. She popped pills. She smoked a shit ton of marijuana. She drank. Um, the way that she drank, she did it in intervals. So she was drinking all around the clock, but tiny bits. Um, so it wasn't like, oh, I think I'll have, you know, a half a bottle of vodka right now. Her husband was aware of this. He was more aware of the marijuana, but she definitely drank. And of course, this brings us to another thing. When you live in a family that is enmeshed in denial, okay, because she comes from one because it was what was happening to her and no one ever did anything. Adults, remember this. If you think it with a child, if you see it with a child, if you feel it with a child, if there are addicts around your child, if there are addictions, get your kids away from this shit because this is a direct result of that. And I do get that. Yes, she is fully responsible for her actions on that day, but she was in a cycle of reactive abuse at that point. She was reacting to the sexual abuse in childhood and it was coming up for some reason, having been triggered from five-year-old to five or six-year-old Kate. I can't remember how old that little girl was, but five or six years old. So it was triggered with Diane and this was part of the problem. Now, she shows me driving down the freeway, okay? She's showing me. Her eyes, she shows me a cartoon character. The cartoon character I see is Mr. Magoo. Literally her eyes cross like this and she can't see shit. It's like she's wearing big thick glasses like Mr. Magoo and she still can't see. She still can't see anything. And in her head, she's like, why the fuck can't I see? I can't see, I don't understand why I can't see. Something happened that caused her eyes. Okay, so you have a right eye and a left eye and you can see, right? Something caused to make him go shh like this in one in one way. And then I see her almost like she's babbling to herself like a child in a state of frozen fear. She is driving the vehicle like she's in a state of frozen fear, like a child rocking back and forth, banging their head against a wall. So something has triggered her so much that she is reacting like an abused child who's sitting in a corner at home and not driving a carload of freaking kids getting ready to kill them herself and the people that are that the car that she hits going the going the correct way on the freaking parkway so she's doing that and she's basically saying what she's seeing through her eyes is different her intention is one thing what she sees through her eyes is another She's coming right up to impact, 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 impact. She knows it's happening. She is aware intellectually it's happening. I can't stop. I can't stop. I can't stop. I'm not going to stop. I can't stop. And then it just flows. And the way that she shows me is it flows like, like, a, um, like a wave. It flows. And she's caught in an emotional part of that wave. And she just 
out of her body she went. She has recognition. The kids don't like to talk about this at all. They don't like it. They don't like that they were taken out of their life. It wasn't supposed to happen. Again, go all the way back to Diane's childhood. Go back to her father. Go all the way back there. Point the fingers there first, then point the fingers at her. Because she didn't get the help that she needed as a child. She was abused in the home as a child. And because she didn't get what she needed, this is a reaction of that. I was never perfect, she says. I was never perfect and they were gonna find out. Somebody was threatening to talk about what happened with her father. Somebody was saying to her, if you, I wonder if that's a threat she got on the phone. If somebody said, if you don't do this, I'll tell what happened with dad or something along those lines, as if it was her fault. This is the veneer that she had up. Something like this is going on or she's making me feel like it did. So that was going on. I wonder if she even told her husband and before they left the campground, he said, you know, I'll let everybody know what happened to you. Uh, yeah, however you want to word that. I, this is just what I'm feeling. Um, when I look at her, I, she asked, now I don't know what religion she was, but she asked for grace to be given to her as she crossed over. I see her kneeling at the skirt of somebody in deep prayer, deep sorrow, and I feel that they had to pick her up, pick her up energetically before she could even deal with what happened. The kids immediately bounced over and were fine, meaning they, they did not feel what was here. Actually, I'm being shown that the only one that felt what was here is the little boy that survived, her son, Brian. My eyes are getting so tired, like the lids are getting so tired. I, I believe like she practically passed out before she drove, went into an altered state, went into a catatonic state, went into an emotional state, a reactive state to a different kind of abuse at a different time. And this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm seeing. The glasses, her eyes are so thick she can't see out of them. She does not know how she ended up dead like that. She does not know why that happened. Now either she's not acknowledging what she was feeling or she really wasn't feeling the description that people are saying. She said her husband was full of shit in some way. He was full of shit about something. Um, she's also talking about her brother and her sister-in-law and she's talking about reconnecting with her mother. So I'm kind of getting all of these different things. But again, I actually think that this woman had this stuff happen to her because she was in the middle of a flashback emotionally, out of body flashback in the midst of pain due to childhood sexual abuse and other kinds of abuse and could not pull her way out of it while self-medicating and then the accident happened. Once the accident happens and you hit the car, you're, I mean, this is what is gonna happen. That's what I'm feeling. That's exactly, and now the energy just went and out. Okay, so once again, my name is Sloan from sloanbella.com.